بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Luqman the wise in his advice in his exhortation in his admonishment of and towards his son so the different ways of tackling this topic speaking on this subject first and foremost is to speak about Luqman the wise Luqman al Hakim who was he was he a prophet first and foremost was he a prophet Secondly, whether we ask the question or not, just a tasa'ul, or bringing it up. Number two is, when did he live? If he was or wasn't a prophet, what time period did he live in? And what race did he come from? These things really don't have but so much significance in the content of his wise counsel. And the content of what he said to his son, that's the most important thing. However... From the concept of mudarasat al Quran, studying the Quran, learning more facts, learning more information, and there's always a benefit of learning about these other pieces of information and these other facts. So, most of the ulama of Islam, they say that Luqman was not a prophet and that he was just a righteous and wise man. Uh, as far as what time period he lived, then that's an even further discussion. And some of the ulama of Islam say that he was Nubian. That he came from Ard Nuba, he was Nubian, as far as his ancestry or heritage or his background. Um, what's important is, as I've just mentioned to you, is what he said to his son. That's the most important thing and the most uh, remarkable part of the story and discussing Luqman is what he said to his son and why he said that to his son. Now, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us. And he explains to us that what we have been given, we've been given nothing more than the best, nothing less than the best. Allah says, we give you, O Muhammad, the best stories. For that which is given to you in this Quran that is revealed to you. And Allah says, and even though before we gave you the revelation, and before we explained to you these stories which are the best and most beautiful, you were unaware. You are unaware. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, He says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ Who is more, who is better than Allah Azza wa Jalla in His judgment? وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ قِيلًا Who is more truthful than Allah in His speech? And this includes and entails the best, the most truthful, the most honest, the wisest, أَحْسَنُ The best in its wording, its content, its instruction, its benefit, and its eloquence. All of that is included in Ahsanul Qasas, the best of stories, the most thorough stories, the most truthful stories, the most honest stories, the wisest of stories, and the best, most eloquent, beautiful manner that it can be possibly presented. So all of that is included in Ahsanul Qasas, the best of all stories. And from the stories of the Quran, which are the best and the most thorough and the most beautiful, is the story of Luqman. Al Hakim, Luqman Al Hakim. May Allah Azza wa be pleased with him, Ali Ghis Salam, etc. That's first and foremost. Secondly, is the summary of the story. And thirdly, what are the main points of focus that we wish to discuss, that we wish to discuss tonight regarding Luqman Al Hakim? As far as the summary of the story, Khulasat Al Qissa wa Khulasat Al Mawidah is that he gave his son an example of how to live and how to die. He told his son everything that he needed to hear with regards to the relationship that he has with his Lord, the relationship that he has with himself, and the relationship that he's going to have with people, other human beings. And there lies, no doubt, the teachings of the Sunnah and the teachings of the Qur'an, the teachings of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Sunnah are totally in harmony, in total harmony. The Messenger of Allah, والسلام, he sums up the whole entire religion and he sums up the things that you do, the people that you encounter, 
what you want to do as a Muslim living and breathing. He says, Fear Allah wherever you are. If you do a bad deed, you make a mistake, immediately fix it with a good deed and treat people honorably. This sums up the relationship between the servant and his Lord. Ittaqillah, fear Allah. That is Allah's right for you to fear Him, to obey Him, to love Him, and to submit to Him no matter what the scenario, and no matter what the case, no matter where you are, no matter what the location. So that is the haqq of Allah. And that is the relationship that is between Allah and the servant, the servant and his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you happen to make a mistake, you fall into a sin, you become victim of your human nature, then get up. Dust yourself off, brush yourself off, get right back into the fight, and fix what you did of bad. And that is by doing a hasana, which will erase the effect of the sayya. And that is haqqul abd. Haqqul insan. That is the, the right that your nafs has over yourself. Haqqul nafs. Your, your soul has a, your soul has a haq upon you. And you're not to tarnish that right. And disregard that right. And disrespect that right. And then last but not least remains, وَخَالِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقِ hasan And treat the people honorably. Don't treat the people in an average, mediocre way. Let alone disrespect them, scorn them, look down upon them, hold them in contempt, thinking that you're better than them. وَخَالِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقِ hasan have excellent moral character. And that is حقوق العباد حق الناس The rights that the people have over you. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this beautiful, beautiful hadith, he summarized all rights that are to be given and received. Fear Allah, give Allah his rights. Make tawbah, do good deeds, give your own nafs its rights. And treat the people in an honorable manner. And that is also found in the story of Luqman the wise. So the summary of the whole entire story, regardless of reading from ayah and ayah, but the summary of the whole story is that he was a good and great father to his son. And he told his son what his son has to do, what his son has to perform, what his son should do, and what his son, what his son cannot do and should not do. That's the summary of it. Is they told him to fear Allah, to obey Allah, do not oppress the rights of Allah, and do not oppress yourself, and for sure do not oppress the people. The next point, one of the most important parts of this story is the beginning of the story. And that is the concept of al-hikmah, wisdom, which we say in the English language, al-hikmah. What is al-hikmah? And what isn't hikmah? How do you obtain hikmah? Is it even possible for you to obtain it? Or is it given to you and granted to you as a gift, as we said earlier, with regards to guidance? And what is included? In that word, wisdom, to be wise. Now, he who studies history and the history of the human being, despite the color, despite the language, despite the geographical location, despite the nature of those people and the time period of those people, wisdom and a person being wise is respected, is coveted all around the board from the most savage and uncivilized people and the things that they did in the course of history, you'll find that the wise one, the wise elder, the wise leader, the wise chieftain, the wise warrior, whatever wisdom, even if it was on Wali al Billah manifested in witchcraft and sihr, but they had wisdom, they had experience, they were always at the summit of society and held in utmost regard. The warrior is one thing, the wealthy person is one thing, the handsome person is one thing, the one who's high-born, quote-unquote, is one thing, but the one who's wise and deep-minded is always respected. And this is a, a fact in all races and all cultures. People respect wisdom, and they respect the person who has been given that wisdom, and the one who shares that wisdom, however they manifest that wisdom, regardless of their religion, their creed, and their practice, etc. So al-hikmah, or wisdom, it's something that we want to focus on tonight, the Ibn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the beginning of the story. As Allah says, and indeed we gave Luqman wisdom. Indeed, we have granted Luqman wisdom. That's what Allah says before he gets into Luqman speaking to his son. Indeed, we have given Luqman hikmah. And then immediately after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us, and he tells, he speaks to Luqman, and he speaks to us, he tells us what the duty is 
for that gift and the debt that is owned for Allah Azza wa blessing you with wisdom. So now let's ask ourselves the question, what is the word hikmah? What does it mean? It's mentioned in the Quran in many places. And there are many hadiths in which hikmah is used. Allah says, Yu'til hikmah to min yasha. Allah gives hikmah to whom He wills. And whoever is given hikmah, وَمَنْ يُؤْتِلْ hikmah فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever is granted hikmah has been given a great gift. Similar to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri in the Sahih, in which the companions asked the Messenger of Allah ﷺ for sadaqah. فَأَعْطَاهُمْ He gave them. And then he asked them for some more. فَأَعْطَاهُمْ He gave them. ثُمَّ سَأَلُوهُ فَأَعْطَاهُمْ And he asked them a third time. And he gave them. And then he said to the Sahaba, حَتَّى نَفِدَ مَا إِنْدَهُ All of the wealth that he had, he, 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 he wasted it in Sadaqah, giving it to the Sahaba. He, 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 he spent all of it, he gave it to them. And he said, مَا يَكُنُ لِي أَوْ مَا يَكُنُ عِنْدِي مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَلَنْ, أن, فلن أَدَّخِرُهُ عَنْكُمْ He says, whatever wealth, and look, pay close attention how Allah called money khair. He called it khair. And this goes to show us, as we have explained to many classes and lessons before, those who say that money is bad, and it's haram to have money, haram to be wealthy, they are not wise people. Money is a good thing. And Allah Azza He called money khair. He called it goodness when it's used and managed properly. But that's not the topic of our discussion. al he says, whatever good I have, whatever wealth I have, I'll never hide it from you. And it shows us the transparency of the leader with his subjects. Don't hide things from the people. Be transparent in your dealings. Show them what is what. Whatever money I have, you have it. There's no coffer that I have. There's no bank, there's no chest of gold and silver that is being hidden from you. Whatever wealth I have, you have. And then he gave the Sahaba instructions about asking and begging. He gave them instructions about being patient. He says, مَنْ يَتَصَبَّرُ If you practice patience, Allah will give it to you. The highlighting point, what I'm trying to get to right now, when Allah says, وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرٍ كَثِيرًا Whoever was given wisdom, he has been given a great deal of good. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَمَا أُعْتِيَ He says, no one has been given. أَعْطَاءً خَيْرٌ وَأَوْسَعْ مِنَ الصَّبُرِ The greatest gift that you can be handed is patience. And that's similar to what Allah says, and whoever is given wisdom, فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرٌ كَثِيرًا And we all know those who study the Quran and Kareem, مَاذَا تُفِيدْ النَّكِرَةً في سياق الإثبات. When Allah mentions an indefinite noun affirming something, Allah doesn't say فقد أُوتي الخير الكثير. خيرا. He's been given a great deal of good in all aspects. So Allah Azza wa Jalla He mentions this word al hikma in many verses in the Quran, and oftentimes it has different meanings. Ibrahim and Ismail with يرفع إبراهيم القواعد من البيت. And remember when Abraham and Ishmael were erecting the foundations of the Kaaba, and they asked Allah to accept from them and to make them Muslims and to accept their repentance. And they made a supplication, Rabbana wa ba'athihim. Oh Allah, sin among these people, a messenger who's from them, the ancestors of the Arabs. And what will he do? He will recite to them your verses. He will purify them and cleanse them. And he will teach them the book and the hikmah. The book and the hikmah. Right. So the word hikmah is mentioned in the Quran in more than one place. As far as the sunnah of the Prophet is also mentioned in several narrations. From those narrations is the report of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in the Sahih. In which the Prophet he says, La hasada illa fitnatain. He says there can be no envy in Islam. You're not allowed to envy any Muslim and to be jealous of any Muslim unless one or two people. One or two people. And from those two people whom you're allowed to envy, quote unquote, is Rajulun Atahu Allahul Hikmah, Fuhu Yu Alimuha, Wa Yaqdibiha, O Fuhu Yaqdibiha, Wa Yu Alimuha Nas, O Kemakal, Alayhi Salatu Islam. The first of the two people whom you're allowed to envy is a man who has been given Hikmah. And what does he do with this Hikmah? He teaches it to the people, Wa Yaqdibiha, and he uses it as, as a means of judgment. People come and they differ and they fight over things and he gives them hikmah. He gives them hikmah. So in this hadith, is this the same meaning of وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ He teaches them the book and hikmah. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And purifies them. Or is it a different meaning? We know in the sciences of the Qur'an, and it's very important for every Muslim to know this, even layman Muslims, 
those who don't study the Arabic language, is that the Quran uses words and terms in different meanings. Sometimes they are synonymous, and sometimes they have different meanings and different usages. So what's meant by this word hikmah in Arabic? And what's meant by this word in English, wisdom? And what does it mean to be wise? So I feel we should discuss this first before we even get into the story of Luqman. And that is because that is one of the highlighting features of that story is that Luqman was wise. So wise that they called him Luqman al Hakim. They didn't call him Luqman, they learn it. Luqman the elder, Luqman the strong, they called him Luqman al Hakim. Meaning that that was the greatest of his characteristics. So there lies no doubt the pinnacle and the summit of the story of Luqman the wise is what? Is wisdom. How to obtain it and what to do with it when you have it. And the greatest thing that you can do with wisdom is pass it on to the next generation. Pass it on to your sons and your daughters. And it's one of the problems that we suffer from right here in San Diego, in California, on the West Coast, the United States, New York City, wherever you go. There are those who have been given wisdom, but they don't pass it on. They don't teach it to the next generation. There's a huge gap between the 18-year-olds, the 16-year-olds, the 15-year-olds, and the 50, 60, and 70-year-olds. And the older brothers and sisters, they say the young generation is lost, like the Pepsi logo. The new generation, the next generation is dead. That's what it says. The new generation is dead. It's lost. In all aspects of the word dead and lost, you talk about style, fashion, respect, crime, even when you talk about music. They say that the music that the people produce today is trash, it's nothing like the old stuff. But whose fault is it that the new generation is lost? Who raised the new generation? Who taught the new generation? Obviously the new generation had to come from someone and had to grow from the feet of someone. And the new generation, they blame the old generation. They say, you guys are outdated, you're archaic, you guys are dinosaurs, you're stuck in the past. It is not the 70s, the 60s, the 80s, that's done, that's over. The 90s era of what? That's, that's not the 90s anymore. This is a reality. Everyone understand this? So I'm not talking about music being permissible. We're trying to make an example. We're trying to make an example. They say this isn't, this isn't the 90s hip hop anymore. It's a brand new generation. That old school stuff that you're saying was the best stuff, that's done. It's a new time period. So we have the old and we have the new. And one of the problems where we have this big, severe, gaping gap is because the wisdom isn't passed down. Or the wisdom is offered, but the young people don't seek it. And they don't have the necessary patience to learn it. And it's another very important part of the story is that Luqman wasn't just wise with himself or to himself. But he was wise and he taught his son wisdom. And the greatest of that wisdom was strengthening, establishing, and solidifying the relationship between his son and his Lord. And his son treating himself with respect and his son treating the other human beings with what? With respect, as we've just stated. So that's the, the focal point of the story, is hikmah, is wisdom. So what do the people of knowledge say regarding this word, uh, al-hikmah? Ma'an al-hikmah lughatan. Al-hikmatu mushtaqatun min kalimat al-hakama wa huwa ma'a hata bi hanaki al-faras summiyat bi thalika li annaha tamna'ahu min al-jari al-shadeed wa tudhillu al-daba li rakibiha حتى تمنعها من الجماح ومنه اشتقاق لحكمة لأنها تمنع صاحبها من أخلاق الأراضل وأحكم الأمر أي أتقنه فاستحكم ومنعه عن الفساد أو منعه من الخروج عما يريد The word حكمة is similar to the word عقل in the Arabic language Intellect, some people translate عقل or others they say smarts having a brain. The word hikmah is extracted from one or two usages in Arabic. And we know that the root word is ha, kaf, and meme. And those who study the Arabic language, they know is that there is a science of the sound of the letters and the sounds of the words. Words being combined and how they sound. When you hear the word hakama, it's not like the word sahula. Hakama, ahkama. The way it sounds proves something. It's not the same. We say sab and we say sahel. The way that you say the word and pronounce the word yuhat is a feeling behind it. And that's a whole science in itself in the Arabic language. So hakama is the root word of the word hikmah. And there's two main usages in the Arabic language. Number one is the word al-hakama. Al-hakama too is basically a muzzle or a rein that goes into 
the horse's mouth or the camel's mouth, the muzzle and the rein that you use to pull, steer, control, and dominate the riding beast. The animal, the horse, is a wild horse, ready to move fast, to throw you off of his back. You use it to slow it down. You use it to steer in a direction. And you use it from jumping and being reckless and too jumpy. This is what the word al-hakama. And the second meaning is ahkam yani atqan. It's to be a very good craftsman. To be extremely skilled with your hands and your fingertips. And your amal is muhkam. It's mastered. It's done. It's finished. You don't have to touch it. I carved this myself. It's nothing else that's needed. It's polished. It's solid oak wood. It'll last you for the rest of your life. You can pass it on to your son. Because I'm a master craftsman. Or what do you talk about? Jewels or metal or whatever the craft is. And we look at a water skin. Back in the day, people didn't have these things. Thermos, steel flasks, glass flasks. They drunk from water skins oftentimes. And if you left it open, there could be a bug or an insect or a critter or dust or dirt that would get into your milk or your water. And it would corrupt your drink. So what did you do with the water skin? You put it tight. They say a drawstring. This is what the word hikmah linguistically means it comes from. It's to tighten something. It's to fasten something, to make a tight knot. And to control the animal from moving and jumping unless it's how you want it to move and how you want it to jump. And that's similar to the word aqal. The aqal comes from the iqal. And the iqal is what you use to control the camel from biting you or going wild and going crazy. And this connection with the technical meaning is hikmah and aql is supposed to prevent you from being stupid. It's supposed to prevent you from being foolish and dumb. It's supposed to stop your nafs from being wild and out of control. And that is summed up in the word being a fool. You're foolish. I want to sleep. I want to rest. But I know I have an exam to study for. And if I fail the exam, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. It's going to be major problems if I fail this exam. But it's all right. I'll wake up in 10 minutes, I'll hit the snooze button. And you're dead tired. What are the chances of you getting up in 10 minutes? What are the chances of you getting up in 30 minutes? You went to sleep and you're exhausted and you have to study for a test? You are a fool. Thinking that you can just crash study at the last second on time. You're foolish. So being dumb, being stupid, and being foolish, no one wants. No one wants to be called dumb and stupid. You can be weak physically. You may not be the most handsome person. But no one wants to be called slow. And one of the first things that a young man or young woman wants to do and wants to be when they grow up and they're trying to grow old fast. Don't try to play me like I'm a little kid. Like I'm a, don't think I'm what? Slow. And this is one of the reasons why we have so much crime in certain cities, in certain towns. Because young children want to grow up too fast and the older people are playing them like they're slow. And I'm going to show you that I'm not slow. I'm going to show you that I understand and I'm not slow. And that's a problem. So the concept of hikmah and aql is meant to prevent you and protect you from doing something that you shouldn't do. And that's what wisdom basically is. It's not just having information, it's not just having a collection of facts, but it's to know the truth and to have the pull and the control over your nafs to implement the truth. Now, as far as what some of the ulama of Islam said regarding hikmah is, first and foremost is we have a quote from Al-Harawi. He says, Al-hikmatu ismun li-ihkami wad'i shay'i fi mudi'ihi. As far as the word hikmah in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then when you read the books of Tafsir, when Allah Azza wa mentions, and whoever is given wisdom, then he has been given a great deal of good. Some of the Sahaba, such as Abdullah ibn Abbas, they said, Al-ma'rifa bin Qur'an. Al-ma'rifa bin Qur'an. Wa nasikhihi, wa mansukhihi, wa halalihi, wa haramihi, wa muqaddamihi, wa muakharihi. He said that hikmah of the Qur'an is to know the rulings of the Qur'an. What's lawful, what's unlawful. When Allah sends down a verse and He makes a rule, and then Allah sends down another verse later on and He changes that rule, like the Qibla. It was abrogated, it was canceled, it was no longer a ruling. But we want a, a more general definition of the word hikmah in the Quran and in the Sunnah and what the people say. So, from uh, uh, those who, who have a definition of the term hikmah, is Abu Ismail al Harawi. He says, Ismun li ihkami shay'i fi maldi'i. It is a term used to perfectly and precisely place something in its proper place. Placing something in its proper place is one thing. This is the shelf where this flask belongs. So I do what? I put it there. 
Is the thermos on the shelf? Did I place it in its proper place? I did. Don't say no, I did. This is where it belongs and I did what? I placed it, correct or incorrect? Did I place it? But that doesn't mean that I placed it what? In a proper manner. Ihkam wadr al-shay. Intabih al-an al-farq. Wadr al-shay fi mawdi'ihi hadha shay. Ihkami wadr al-shay. Placing the thing in its proper place in the what? Perfect manner. I would understand this. Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he said, Al-hikmatu fi'lu ma yanbaghi. Ala al-wajh alladhi yanbaghi. Fi al-waqt alladhi yanbaghi. Ibn Qayyim, he says, Hikmah, wisdom, is to do what needs to be done. It's to do not what you want to do, but do what has to be done. In the proper manner, at the proper time. We say to be smooth. I didn't have to make a whole sentence, just one statement. I didn't have to make a whole entire paragraph, just one sentence. In a smooth, eloquent way, which no one can differ and disagree on. That's being smooth, and being smooth is a part of hikmah. It's to do and to say what's what? Necessary. In the way that is what? Necessary, but most importantly, everything in life is based off of what? Timing. You came too late. You said it too late. You did it too late. You have to be what? Right on time with what you do and what you say. That's proper. That was Ibn Qayyim's definition of al-hikmah. Moving forward. Imam al-Nawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al-hikmah tu ibaratun an al-ilm al-muttasaf bil-ahkam. المشتمل على المعرفة بالله تبارك وتعالى المسحوب بالنفاذ البصيرة وتهذيب النفس وتحقيق الحق والعمل به والصد عن اتباع الهوى والباطل والحكيم من له ذلك انتهى كلامه رحمه الله تعالى No, he said, hikma is a phrase and it's used for knowledge of the rulings and that goes back to the word that we previously mentioned ahkam the ruling of something is based off of its hikmah, its wisdom. So knowing what's halal and what's haram, that's in the deen, in life, knowing how to drive a car, knowing how to own a home, knowing how to run a successful house, how to be a good father, how to be a good mother, a coach on a team. You have to know how to inspire your players, encourage your players, how to make your players feel bad when they mess up and make mistakes, but don't cause them to despair. And get them by Allah's permission to win the game. You have to know the rulings. He says, Al Mushtamilu al Al Ma'rifati Billahi Ta'ala. And at the top of the list is knowing Allah, the Mighty and the Most High. So you can't be wise if you don't know Allah. You cannot be wise if you don't know who your Creator is. And if you do not know who made you and who fashioned you and who deserves to be worshipped alone without any partner. That's first and foremost. And Allah's names and attributes, there's no wisdom. And those who say, Tariqat al Salafi Aslam, when it comes to the old school and the new school, when it comes to the different aqidah in Islam and the creeds of Islam, the way of the Salaf is the safest route. It's the safest route. And the way of the later generations is a'lamu wa ahkamu. It's more scientific and contains more wisdom. That's a lie and that can't be true. And that's because if you don't affirm Allah's attributes, and if you do not describe Allah in the manner in which He has described Himself, then you don't know Allah. You have no knowledge of Allah if everything is figurative. And it really doesn't mean this. And 30 attributes all have one general meaning. Iradat to thawabi wal in'am. 30 characteristics of Allah, you give them all the same interpretation. That's not knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that perfection is manifested in diversity of names and qualities. Titles. Why do generals wear the things on their chests? They show you the things that they have accomplished and obtained. This war, a veteran of this one, that, he has accomplished things. The more attributes and qualities a person has, it leads to that person's perfection. So if you do not know Allah, Azawajal, then you cannot be wise. If you don't know who Allah is, as He has said about Himself, it's impossible to be what? To be wise. Know what He says, Al-Mas'hubi bi nafadhil basira. And another condition of wisdom is that you have to have piercing insight. You have to be able to see through things and people. And you have to be able to see things before they happen. As a wise man supposedly, quote unquote, once said, he says to uh, hear thunder is no sign of sharp hearing. 
To see lightning is no sign of sharp sight. To lift an arm here is no sign of strength. No. You have to see the victory or the defeat before it manifests itself. You have to have foreknowledge of what's going to happen. And this foreknowledge isn't something spooky. It isn't something mystical. It isn't something pertaining to sin. No. Foreknowledge is based off of experience. Experience, and that's the concept of al-qiyas. فَأَتَبِرُوا يَأُولِ الْأَبْصَارِ Allah says, use a bridge, O men of understanding. Use ubur. You start at one place, you go to the destination, and you return to your origin. I.e., what happened to these people, how Allah saved this person, how Allah destroyed this person, is the same thing that's going to happen to someone a thousand, two thousand, Allah alam, how many years later? You make qiyas. It's the same thing. So I can foresee, inshallah, that you're going to be successful. Inshallah, Ta'ala. You seem like a humble young man, a respectful young man, a hard-working young man. Only Allah knows the unseen, but I've, I doubt it very highly that you'll be an unsuccessful person. And I can see, and Allah knows best, that you're going to be a failure in life because you have no respect for your elders. You have no respect for yourself. You're lazy, you're lethargic, you have a smart and sarcastic mouth. You don't want to do anything, or you're spoiled, rotten. Your parents give you everything, you have to work for nothing. I can't see you being successful later on in life. And in most cases, that's what's going to happen. How? Because of previous experiences. So you have to have the basira that pierces and penetrates. You have to be able to see things before they take place. And this is manifested in sports. It's manifested in reading the defense when you play football. You know how to read the defense. You throw less interceptions. You know how to make a pump fake. You know what defense they're showing you. It's a zone blitz. It's a zone blitz. You know when to call a screen pass, when to do this, when to do a draw, when to take off, scramble, and leave the pocket. Because your basira, it pierces and penetrates, and it goes beyond that which is in front of you. He says, with tahdeeb nafs and purification of the soul. You cannot be a wise person, and you make your soul dirty and filthy. As Allah Azawajal says, qad aflah man, he says it's successful for those who do what? Purify their souls. وَقَدْ khaba. And then those who ruin their souls, they're losers. They're not wise people. So a, an important part of wisdom is purifying the soul. الحق, and actualizing and manifesting the truth. بِهِ, you can't be wise if you're sinful and disobedient. You can't be wise if you don't act upon what you know yourself. And there's another problem with regards to father and son, or mother and daughter, or mother and son and father and daughter. And that's why we make excuses for ourselves. And we say, do as I say and not as I do. Do what I say, son. Don't do what you see me doing. You can say that as much as you want to do. But actions speak louder than words. Tell your son not to smoke cigarettes. It's bad, son. Listen to me. But you keep smoking cigarettes. The chances are is that your son is going to smoke cigarettes. Even though you told him not to do it. And that's because the human being is more attracted to action than statement. So a part of wisdom is you implementing it and acting upon it yourself. He says in this wisdom, al-mashub, he says, it accompanies was-saddi an ittiba' al-hawa wal-batil. And it must prevent you from being lustful and following your lust and your low base desires, which all humans have. Some have more than others. More than others, wali'adhu billah. Following your lust, your hawa. You know what's destructive, you know what's haram, you know what's ruinous, but your soul is craving that thing. If you fall victim to your cravings, you cannot be called a wise person. Last but not least, he says, well, Hakimu man lahu dhalika. And that is who is Hakim. It's the one who has all of those characteristics and qualities. Khayrin, inshallah. So let's get into the story. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, after we seek his refuge from the accursed shaitan, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Allah says, and indeed we have granted Luqman wisdom. And we explained this. And the first point we learn from this is that wisdom is minnatun ilahiyah. It's a gift from Allah. But it doesn't mean that you can't try and strive to obtain it. Just like taqwa. And just like guidance. Allah starts it off by giving you the gift. But there are reasons behind it being firm. There are reasons behind you solidifying that wisdom and building upon that wisdom and polishing that wisdom. And what was the first responsibility of Luqman? Anushkur lillah. It's to thank Allah. Thank me for giving you the wisdom. And what happens when you thank Allah, brothers and sisters? You're doing a favor for Allah. You're helping out Allah. Allah says, whoever thanks 
and shows gratitude, then he's doing it for himself and not for Allah. And you must teach your sons and your daughters this. Son, by you doing the right thing, it's not helping me. You're not thanking me. It's not respecting me, but in actuality, you're respecting yourself. And when you disrespect yourself, you can't expect no one else to respect you. So oftentimes, we make ourselves the most important thing. That's because we have egos. Everything is about the father and the mother. Respect your mother, obey your mother. Do this, be good in school for your mother. That's important. But most importantly, the thing that's going to remain with them in most cases is the value of their own self. Don't go outside dressed like that because you're disrespecting yourself. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't get a tattoo on your face and your neck because you're disrespecting yourself. Don't get a tattoo on any part of your body, let alone on your face or your neck. You're disrespecting yourself. And you're announcing to the world that you're a foolish person. So we have to instill this in our children is that thanks and gratitude are for Allah Azza wa Jalla. And those who show thanks and gratitude, you're not helping out Allah, but you're actually only helping out your own self. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, and whoever, whoever disbelieves, then Allah is Ghani yun Hamid. Allah is Ghani, self-sufficient. He has, there's nothing that you can even say to compare to what Allah has of self-sufficiency, of wealth. Ghani. He needs nothing from no one. He needs no donation from anyone. And look at the beauty of the Qur'an. Allah says, who will give Allah a good loan? Who will give Allah a good loan? Look at the, look at the, 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 the mercy and the kindness of Allah. And look how Allah Azza wa draws himself near to his servants. Who will give me a good loan? Does Allah need your loan? Is it helping out Allah? No, it's not. But Allah Azza wa inspires and encourages you to give sadaqah and he calls it qardan hasanan, a good loan. And we all know, wadillahi al-mathal al-a'la, there's no comparison between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his created beings. But the concept, Allah says you will see Allah, the Prophet says you will see Allah like you see the moon. Laylat al-Badr. If there was a, a man who came up to you, and the man was very wealthy, and very influential, or at one point in time he was wealthy and influential, and this man is known to be a mover and a shaker. He was a major person in his time or in his day, before he went to jail, before he lost his business, whatever the case may be. And he says, listen, I need to borrow some money. I'm going to give you back your money in such and such amount of time. I'm a little down and out. Can you help me out? In most cases, the smart person is going to give that man the money. And that's because, number one, he has a clean record and he's trustworthy. He's going to pay me back my money, and nine out of ten times, he'll never ever forget what I did for him when he was down and out. And that is when he's back on top like he was, he's not going to forget it, and he's going to give me much, much more than what I gave him. So only a foolish person would resist and hesitate in loaning that wealthy, rich, powerful person that money. So just think about that now. Allah Azza wa Jal, he causes it a good loan, and what does he say? فَيُضَعِفَهُ And he increases it and multiplies it. So you give Allah, quote unquote, a little bit. Allah will give you back what you spent, and what? Much, much more. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Hamid, and he's praised in all situations. For whoever disbelieves and disbelieves, Allah is praised, the mighty and most high. وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِدُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْتِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Allah says, and remember when Luqman was admonishing his son, and the very first thing that he told his son is to know Allah, is to love Allah, is to be connected to Allah, and never disrespect Allah. Don't make shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's because it's the worst thing that you can possibly do. Is to compare the one who's perfect from all aspects, to someone who's deficient in all aspects. That's the worst thing that you can do. And that's the pinnacle of foolishness. Is the one who gave you everything that you had, and then show thanks and gratitude for someone who did nothing for you. And that is going back to wisdom once more. Shirk doesn't go hand in hand with wisdom. Tawheed, there lies no doubt, makes total and perfect sense. Allah is the only creator, the only sustainer, therefore he should be the only ma'bud. And if you believe that Allah is the only one who helped you and did things for you, why would you thank someone else? So Luqman salam, first and foremost, he told his son not to make shirk. That was the first piece of advice. Moving forward, Allah says, insan then Allah says, and we have enjoined upon man to be respectful, kind and obedient to his parents. These two verses here 
are not the words of Luqman. Allah Azza wa he mentions these two ayah in the middle of the story of Luqman's speech. And it's very important to understand the Quranic style. A verse begins with Allah speaking directly, or a verse begins, وَقَالَ Rasul, The messenger said, this person said, the king said, their prophet said, and then Allah will speak in the middle of the story. And a non-Muslim, or an Orientalist, or someone will come along and say, the Quran doesn't make any sense. It's taken, it, it supports polytheism. Allah speaks and the prophet speaks, and it says, fear me at the end of the ayat. They don't understand the Quranic style. So the story of Luqman, this, these verses are not a part of the what? The story of Luqman. When Allah says, well, we'll say al insan, And we, had, we have advised man to respect his parents. That is not a part of the what? The discourse between Luqman and his what? And his son. That's not a part of the discourse. Everyone understand this? And this is very important with regards to understanding the Quran properly. Moving forward. Allah Azza He says that Luqman alayhi salatu wasalam, He said, يَا بُنَيَّ إِنَّهَا إِن تَكُوا مِثْخَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدٍ فَتَكُونَ فِي صَخْرَةٍ أَوْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ أَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَأْتِ بِهَا اللَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَطْهِيفٌ خَبِيرٌ يَا بُنَيَّ عَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَعَانِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Allah Azza wa Jal, He then commands, or He then tells the Luqman, commands his son once more to obey Allah, and to respect Allah, and to be mindful and conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is manifested in Allah's infinite knowledge and Allah's omnipotence and His power. No matter how small, no matter how subtle, no matter how minute a thing may be, Allah knows of it and Allah has power over it. So don't think that you can escape Allah. I will get old, I will pass, I will die. You may not listen to me and obey me, but Allah always sees you. Allah never dies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you no matter where you go. And if we've instilled this in our children, we have obtained a great success. And that hijab is not just for a country. Salat is not just for a country. Piety and righteousness and respect is not just for a country. And it's not just respect to me. And many parents, they make this mistake. Their children are obedient to them, but to their teachers, they're evil. They're disrespectful to another person, a stepmother, a stepfather. And that's not the proper tarbiyah. You must teach your son and your daughter, anyone who's a grown-up must be respected, period. Bottom line, anyone who's a grown-up is to be respected. And many people, we only teach our children to respect and to obey us. And that's wrong. So the, Allah, Azzawajal, He says that if it's a mustard grain, a mustard seed, no matter how small it is, Allah Azzawajal, will manifest it, it will bring it out. So be mindful is that your relationship with Allah Azza wa is universal. And the commandments of Allah are universal. There's no time, there's no, there's no place in which a person is only to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this must be instilled in the child. Moving forward, Luqman alayhi salam, he told his son to establish the prayer, enjoy the good, forbid the evil, and be patient upon that which befalls you. In the dhalikam in azmin umur. Be patient upon hardships and difficulties. Be patient upon that. As Umar radiallahu anhu was called to have said, la tadum. He says, be rough and tough. Have the ability to be rough and tough. Because bounties do not remain forever. Have the ability to walk. Because the car may not always be there. Have the ability to park and to turn and to stare without the camera. Because you may be in a car that's much older. If you don't know how to park, if you can't back out without the camera, you may be in a situation in which there is no camera. So nothing will ever, ever be like the original, traditional way. And that is the concept of East meets West, old school versus new school. Teach your sons and daughters the ways of the old, but do not allow them to be stuck and frozen in the past. Because you never know when the technology will not work. What happens now if my iPad goes blank? If the battery dies, then what? I have nothing to read, I have no knowledge. That's going to be a what? That's a major problem. Moving forward, Luqman alayhi salam, he told his son, وَلَا تُصَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَلٍ فَخُورٍ Before that, he says, وَاسْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ Be patient upon what befalls you. And the benefit that we take from this is to teach your children, everyone is not going to be your friend. And life isn't always rosy and peachy. People will differ with you. They'll disagree with you. And do not be a yes man and do things and say things only to obtain the pleasure of the people. 
And it's a tremendous life lesson. I believe it's time for the Adhan now. 9.20, what time is it? Four more minutes. Four more minutes. inshallah. Very important life lesson, brothers and sisters. Everyone is not going to be your friend. Everyone is not going to agree with you. Train your children to have this mindset from day one. I do this because it makes me happy, not because it makes the next man happy. Luqman alayhi salam, he then said, Waqsid fi mashika, he says, and when you walk, walk moderately. Walk balanced. Don't walk too fast. Don't walk too slow. Don't be too hard. Don't be too soft. Waqsid fi mashik. Be moderate. And obviously it's greater than just walking. But it's teaching the child balance. Be balanced, son. Dress nice. Be presentable. Smell good. But don't be too pretty. Don't be too fragile. Don't be too conscious over your appearance. Be mindful of that. You teach your daughter to be ladylike. To be dainty. But at the same time, do not allow anyone to oppress you and to wrong you. And think that it's easy pickings because you're a woman and you're a female. But be balanced. Be right in the middle. Don't be a coward. Nor try to act like you're a tough guy. Self-defense is one thing. Wisdom is one thing. Balance and moderation is one thing. You don't have to fight yourself and try to be too tough. And how many problems do children find themselves in because they don't have balance? In a gunfight, it's the fake tough guy that gets shot first. In a fist fight, a knife fight, it's the one that's running his mouth and acting tough is the one who gets hurt first. And the cool-headed, moderate person is, in most cases, the last to be included in the fight. Teach your children balance and moderation in deen and in dunya, money, looks, whatever you do, video games, balanced. Be moderate. Don't sit in front of a video game all day. But at the same time, you've worked hard, you've studied the Qur'an, you've done your chores, fadda. You let them play a video game. And we've done a khutbah before, and we talked about video games and the benefits of video games. The good in video games. Video games that are proper, and it's, if it's done in the proper way, it is a great deal of good that can be taken from a video game. And from the greatest benefits of video games is teaching children how to follow instructions and obey rules. How to follow instructions and obey rules. Wallahi. You may give your son a lecture. You may beat your son with a belt. You may put your daughter on punishment because they didn't obey the rules and didn't follow instructions. And they may do it in two seconds from a video game. You can't get from one board to the next unless you do what? What do you have to do? You have to follow the instructions. And you have to follow the rules. The arrow is pointing this way. This is glowing. This is the icon that you have to get. You can't do what you want to do. And you teach your children well, how can the, that's life. If you want to do it successfully, you got to follow the right way. Just think about that now. <coughs> Have you ever heard about this before? You ever think about this? Video games are evil, it's haram. That's all you hear about video games. And that's not absolutely true. Let alone the fact that video games have come and they aren't going, what? Hey, what? Anywhere. So if video games aren't going anywhere, then at least we can do what? Try to reap some what? Benefit, Benefit from them. It's very important. And as a parent, you have to realize it's 2019. You can take your son's phone. You can say you can't have a smartphone. He'll find it, what? In another place. He'll get it in another location. So the best thing to do is to teach him how to take the benefit from it. Wallahu ta'ala. Moving forward. Waqdud min sawtik. Inna ankar al-aswati la sawtul hamir. Never yell. Never holler. Never scream. And most importantly, never be a loud mouth. Someone that talks too much, that runs his or her mouth, that speaks too loudly. Be subtle, be balanced. This is a very important lesson to teach your children. Then Luqman alayhi salatu wasalam, he told his son. And he says, in the worst voices, la sawtul hamir, is the brain of the ass, of the, 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 of the donkey. An animal that lacks intelligence. An animal that is strong, powerful, but it lacks the brilliance mentally. Now, we talk about a donkey, an example that the people make with donkeys. Huh? al himat A donkey that carries books. That's a very, very long discussion with regards to the donkey in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah. What's important is, these are some benefits and a brief, simple, humble commentary, ta'liqat, on this tremendous story. The proper time, the proper setting to break it down verse by verse, word by word. It obviously isn't in one lecture. And hopefully I believe that inshallah ta'ala we've yani qad alqayna ba'd al adwa 
we've shed some type of light on a story, its importance, and the greatest part of this story is wisdom. And that's why Allah mentioned that first and foremost. We have given Luqman wisdom. Then he told Luqman what to do, to thank Allah, and then he begins by saying what Luqman said to his son of ta'lim and hikmah teaching them wisdom, and on top of that are the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rights of the nafs, and the rights of the what? Of the people. And if you have done that by Allah's permission, you're on the road of being a successful parent. A successful parent. The Prophet sallallahu he says that there are seven people on the day of judgment that shall receive the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A day in which there's no cover, no shade, unless it's the shade that Allah provides. And we all know the very first one, he says, Imamun Adilun, is a just ruler. Washabun nasha fi ta'ati rabbihi. And it's the youth, the young man, the young woman who grows up worshiping and obeying Allah. So if that's the reward of the young man and of the young woman, then what is the reward of the parent, the guardian who raised that young man and that young woman? If he gets the reward and the fruit of growing up being pious and righteous, then what will happen with the parent and the guardian? So it's very important and very virtuous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. We ask Him by His beautiful names and perfect attributes to allow us to benefit from this story, implement this story, and to make our households better, our homes better, our messages better, our countries better, and everything better. Pleasing to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala.